Okay, our goal for today is to look at graphing skills. You guys have done some of this in science and in math class, but it's a super important skill and I want to make sure you have everything you need to know about your graphing skills before we start learning about uh, physics. So your objective for this lesson, know the way to construct a good graph and be able to identify graph types. So the first thing is, what's the purpose of a graph? A graph lets us know how two variables are related. When you conduct an experiment, the whole point of the experiment is to see how one thing affects another. So that's what the graph will allow us to do. Why do we do that? To create an equation. The whole point of a graph is to create an equation. Why do we want an equation? so we can make predictions. Predictions about things that haven't happened yet. Or to work backwards and explain why something that's already happened, happened. So parts of a good graph is what we're gonna start with and then we're gonna look at some simple graph types. The more complicated graph types we'll hit in the next lesson. Start out, draw me a graph an x, y axis, and try to have approximately the same number of lines that I threw in here. And this graph is going to be used to graph out surface area versus time of reaction. So what we did is we had baking soda in different size clumps. Same amount of baking soda, but we broke it up so it had either more or less surface area and we timed how long that baking soda would react with a certain amount of vinegar at room temperature. We collected our data and now we want to graph it. The first thing we need to do is decide what's going to go on which axis. And it's not just something that you do randomly. The rule is independent variable on the x. Independent variable refers to the variable that you control. Which one of these did you consciously change during the experiment? And for us, it was surface area. So surface area is going to be on the x-axis. It is our independent variable, which leaves time of reaction, which is our dependent variable. Dependent variable means the variable that we don't control, but nature controls. Okay, so independent, dependent. Then you want to put a title on your graph, and it always works the same way. You write dependent versus independent for the conditions, whatever those conditions happen to be. So let's see it in real life. For our independent variable, surface area. For the uh, dependent variable, that's our time of reaction. And then the title would be reaction time versus surface area. The conditions are for 10 grams of baking soda at 25 degrees. Okay, so this lets the person know viewing the graph, the conditions, and what it is we're plotting. It's always Y versus X, dependent versus independent. Your next step is to figure out the scale so you can fit all your numbers on the graph. Find the highest number on the X, which is 9.8. Count up your number of things, 1, 2, 3, 4, 5, 6. Make sure that the 9.8 makes it at least to the halfway point. You don't need to have the 9.8 all the way at the right, but don't have it so close to the origin that it doesn't at least get to the halfway point. Probably a number that makes the most sense would be to have your 10 appear right here. And that happens by having each of these blocks worth two. So it's zero, two, four, six, eight, ten, 10. And not that we need it, but we could put a 12 there if we wanted. Most times you're gonna start at zero. We're gonna start at zero for the Y. 
We're going to find our highest y value, which is around 16. We're going to count them up. There are six lines going in the y. So again, we got to have 16, make it at least to the halfway point. And probably the smartest thing to do here would be to have 18 at the top, which would make each of these worth three. Three, six, nine, 12, 15, 18. And then our 16 is somewhere in this area up here. Okay? So this is how we set up our graph. Once we have it all set up, we can then just plot our points in the proper spot and see what kind of relationship we get. When all said and done, we have our data points looking like this. And we can see that as our surface area gets bigger, our time gets less. So as we progress to the right, our values go down. This is a graph type that is known as inverse. Do not worry about inverse graphs yet. We're gonna be talking about those tomorrow. I'd like to stick with just simple graph types. So for today, two that you have to worry about. The first type is called a linear graph. A linear graph is where the points go upward at a constant rate. So every time you move over five blocks this way, you go up about two and a half blocks on the Y. It goes up at a constant rate. The rate at which it climbs is called the slope. The B is called your y-intercept. It's the spot where it hits the y-axis. So then you'd have y equals mx plus b. The m is the slope, and the b is the intercept. Now in real life, do not call it y. Whatever is on the y-axis should go in this spot. Whatever's in the x-axis, that should go in where the x is. So the x and the y are placeholders for the values on your graph. Sometimes you have, in fact this is a very common graph, sometimes you have a linear graph that actually goes through the origin, and then it's not called linear anymore, you call it proportional, and it's just y equals mx. The y-intercept is zero, so it is not needed. So you have your slope and your y and your x value. One special property of a proportional graph that you should know is that if you double your x value, it will double the y value. That is true for proportional. It is not true for linear. This is the more common uh, type of graph, okay? Doubling the X doubles the Y. Tomorrow, we're gonna to talk about some more complicated graph types, but for today, I wanna to make sure you guys know how to set up a graph and be able to identify some simple things about linear and proportional graphs.